Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction. You didn't have to read the whole thing, but that's okay. Um, I'm very happy to address your group tonight. I, uh, when I arranged it with Paul last year, I figured, you know, by this time in 2021, you know, everything back to normal and I'd be there in life. I'd, I'd rather make a presentation in real time, in real life, but this is uh, it's pretty good too. So uh, let me get started here. Uh, let's see, let's take the share of the screen. Let's see, there's that. Okay, you got that, see that? We can, Ron, thank you. It's showing oh. perfectly, thank you. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, basically <clears throat> I collect the, the classical period of Canadian philately just after the Pence, it's the sense uh, they went from the British system to the US system in 1859. And uh, I, as, as I as was mentioned, I have been exhibiting this for quite, you know, quite some time now. You're gonna see a lot of these uh, patriotic covers tonight. Uh, this is an area that I really like because they're bright and colorful and uh, they depict a lot of interesting uh, scenarios, uh, many things related to the Civil War. And you'll see as I get into it, how that uh, folds out. Uh, if you're not a Canadian collector, you may not know that the, what the decimal period is. And these are the stamps that came out during the 1859 to 68. Uh, I won't go through what, what they're used for, the rates, but uh, each of those was designed for a specific rate, uh, you know, domestic, cross-border or uh, overseas. So you'll be seeing a lot of these, these stamps tonight. Now, if you look at the top here, this decimal period was 1859 to 1868. Well, guess when the Civil War was? It was 1861 to 1865. So there was a definite overlap. And that's how I kind of got into the, the Civil War stuff because my main interest is uh, the, the rates of, of, of these covers that are sent all over the world through Canada, cross-border, interprovincial, and so on. So I'm gonna give you a little background information before I get into the main part of the presentation uh, about the, uh, these patriotic envelopes, because I said, you're gonna see a lot of them tonight. Um, they were very, very popular during the Civil War. Uh, almost as soon as the, the Fort Sumter occurred, <clears throat> uh, printers started making these patriotic covers, patriotic envelopes to cover all sorts of things and to work up the public sentiment toward supporting the war effort and so on. There were many, many companies and many, many designs, uh, over 7,000 designs of different patriotics. And I'll be showing you a whole mixture of different types. Um, Union patriotics dominated. It, it turns out that the Confederates um, actually ran out of paper uh, in about 1863, a couple of years after the war got started. And so they were using things like wallpaper and, and you know, office literature and stuff to, to make envelopes. So there's not many Confederate uh, patriotic covers. Uh, in fact, the most famous collection was Professor John Bischel, uh, who uh, sold his collection at Nutmeg Auctions in 2000. And in his <clears throat> collection, which is the most extensive that had ever been put together, he had 5,800 plus Union patriotic covers and only 176 Confederate. So that kind of tells you that the Confederate uh, uh, production of these covers uh, these envelopes was, was pretty rare. Um, how to get started in this? Well, two things. Uh, I was inspired by Ed Richardson's uh, Collect Canada Covers. And this is the, the little book that, I, that he wrote. He was a member of BNAPS uh, back in the, the 60s and 70s when we were just getting started. And uh, he wrote this book and it really had, it was a nice potpourri of all the different ways you can collect uh, Canada covers, you know, from patriotics, the hotel covers, et cetera, et cetera. So that was one thing that kind of got me started. And I'll get into a little bit of detail on that in a minute. Um, whoops. Um, the other thing was, I, I don't know if you ever went to these mega shows they used to have in New York City, if Mad like at Madison Square Garden or other places like that. New York for me is only a couple hour drive. So I would go up to these shows usually on a Friday or a Saturday. And uh, as I was there, one of the mega shows, uh, I was just getting ready to leave. And I uh, you know, asked my typical question, do you have any ca Canadian covers? And one dealer said, well, I got something here that uh, it was a little more expensive than what I was used to paying for it. But it was a uh, uh, patriotic cover that was sent from Canada to the US. 
And uh, he offered it to me and it wasn't real cheap, but it was also, he said, you'll never regret buying this, this cover. And I really haven't. Um, in this, in Ed Richardson's book, uh, he had on chapter six, a little uh, chapter just on patriotic covers, Civil War patriotic covers used in Canada. And in his entire life, and he was a fairly uh, rigorous postal history collector, he got six of these covers all together. Well, in my almost 30 years now collecting these covers, I've found 52 patriotic covers that were used in Canada and sent to the U.S., sent domestically within Canada, sent to the provinces or overseas destinations. And I'm only going to talk about the covers today that were sent from Canada to the U.S. because that ties more into the Civil War theme. So I've got 57 uh, patriotic covers. I'm going to just show you, you know, some of them uh, sent to all over the place. The problem that I've run into is there's zero patriotic covers from the, from the Confederacy that was sent to or from Canada. And I've talked to all the big Canadian, or excuse me, all the big Civil War people uh, like uh, Trish Kaufman and, and Brian Green and uh, Mr. Kimborough and, and a few others, and they've never seen one. So I'm pretty sure I'm not going to run into a Confederate cover going to Canada. And when you, I'm going to talk about this later on, but it was very difficult once the war started and the blockade went up by Lincoln and the post office start, stopped delivering uh, Confederate mail, that uh, getting a, a, a letter into Canada uh, to or from Canada was real tough. So we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a few minutes. Um, these Civil War patriotic covers have magnitudes of themes. You know, they go things like patriotic patriotic themes like the portraits of Washington and Franklin, campaign covers, military, battleships, uh, uh, females with flags, eagles, globes, you name it. Um, there, there's just so many different things that you can, you can collect uh, in these patriotic covers. And it's also a very big collecting area in the US uh, area too. There's a lot of people collect patriotic covers. You can buy a blank patriotic cover. These things were produced by the thousands, okay? Uh, especially the union ones. And you can buy, buy patriotic covers on eBay any day of the week. And they're usually $20, $20 $30. Maybe if it's a rare design, it'll, it'll cost you $100. But um, they're very clean and very nice. And they're very easily faked. So you have to be very, very careful in buying these uh, Civil War patriotic covers. And some of them I've had to send out for a cert just to make sure that it was, it was real. But I'm getting pretty good now at reading these decimal covers. So I'm almost an expert myself. And I haven't been sending them out lately. But anyway, so that you see one on the upper left there. It would be a blank one. You see now there's a, a woman sitting on a U.S. flag, a Union flag. There's an eagle next to her on a something or other. Um, Note that like the cover on the upper right, uh, during that time period of the decimal period of Canada, and it's also in the US, about half the covers, half the letters sent were stampless and half of them were franked with stamps. So you're gonna see a lot of covers that were stampless covers, but if you even collect that period of US postal history, you're going to see many, many stampless covers. And they're just as collectible in my book as ones that are franked, but... Uh, people still prefer to get frank ones um the one on the lower left is one of my foreign covers that's going to dublin ireland i have uh, foreign covers going somebody brought a, a, a limb lope over into canada and sent it to uh heaven to ireland to scotland to the uk i even have one that was sent to switzerland so those are you know pretty hard to find i haven't discovered any of those in the last 20 years but anyway that's the kind of themes you get plaque uh uh Eagles, uh, globes, all kinds of stuff like that. You're going to see a lot of this tonight. Now, how are these things obtained? Well, uh, you could go to a stationery store and buy, remember there were 200 producers, so every stationery store would sell these. But they were also sold to soldiers out on the battlefield. And so these uh, sellers would go around, you know, with a little box, boxes of these things. And in this box would be some envelopes. Uh, with some patriotic theme, you'd get uh, some 10 sheets that would have, you know, something patriotic on it. You'd get a pencil, 
uh, a pen, and, you know, some blotting paper. What I thought was interesting is you don't get ink. Even though you get a pen and a blotting paper, there's no ink. <laughs> so the soldier would have to, if he's going to do an ink uh, version of his letter, he had to go find it somewhere. But these were all designed and sold uh, to uh, the soldiers to send letters home to their loved ones, their girlfriends, their parents, and boyfriends or whatever. But uh, this was, I found this in at the NAPAC show a couple years ago. One of the dealers had this particular, this is only the top of the box. I'd rather have found a whole box of stationery and stuff with everything in it, but that's the best I can do. And it was 25 cents and 25 cents in 1861, 1862 was quite a bit of money. So uh, I'm not sure they could always afford these things. But people always ask when I show them sometimes some of the patriotic covers, that they're basically sometimes in not real good condition. But you gotta remember a lot of these covers were carried by the soldiers as they were out there in the trenches fighting the, you know, the, the Confederates. And uh, so they'd probably you know, write a letter, put it in their pocket and take it back to, the, to the, um, the, the postal wagon that shows up at their camp. And uh, so a lot of these, these covers have been well-worn. All right, what are some of the important dates in uh, explaining the, the involvement of Canada and the cross-border relationships with the U.S. and the Confederacy during the war. Well, first of all, Great Britain had abolished slavery in the empire in 1833. So most Brits, most uh, Canadians, uh, people from all over in the British Empire never really thought about slavery as being something that's, that's feasible. <clears throat> uh, in uh, 1859, uh, early, uh, late 1859, John Brown, uh, maybe you've heard about him at Harper's Ferry. John Brown actually uh, got, took a trip to Canada and working with the Canadians, there were a lot of sympathizers because the Canadians, of course, were abolitionists for the most part. They weren't slave owners and they weren't pushing slavery at all. And John Brown's idea was to get a, an army of escaped or uh, uh, slaves and he was going to get them armed and went up to Canada to get uh, money and, and for munitions and stuff. And uh, uh, had a lot of people following him at, the, at this Harper's Ferry where he was going to uh, attack an arsenal and grab all the weapons and cannons and stuff out of the arsenal. But that went awry and he was caught, tried and hung uh, a few months later. On December 20th, 1860, the first state, South Carolina, seceded from the Union. Uh, that was before the actual Confederacy was formed in February 4th, 61. Uh, the rest of the stuff is history. The Fort Sumter firing uh, was in, in April. Uh, after that, uh, that attack on Fort Sumter, Lincoln proclaimed the blockade, which meant that the whole Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico was blockaded by the U.S. Navy. So it was very hard for uh, Southern ships to get in and out of the harbors because a lot of times they would be met by uh, one of these um, uh, ships from the, the U.S. the Union Navy. Uh, eventually, it was really funny, when the states started to secede, the U.S. Postal Service was still delivering mail for the Confederates, even though they were not part of the Union anymore. And uh, that's kind of an interesting period of, of postal history. But in the end of May, all postal services between the U.S. and the Confederacy ended. Uh, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, Britain declared neutrality. Uh, I think the Union was counting on British to support the effort, but Britain needed to have the cotton from the South in order, they had big textile mills going on in uh, England and, and uh, somewhere in Scotland at the time, and uh, they needed the, the, the cotton. So they declared neutrality, which meant that Canada being part of the British Empire was also neutral. And that caused a lot of ill feelings between, uh, especially the Union and the, uh, uh, the Canadians. Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed in the middle of the war, as we all know about, and Lee surrendered to Grant in 65 April, and the war was over. So things that a lot of people don't know about Canada though was Canadians were a very large percentage, well, not a large percentage, but a large number of Canadians actually came and fought in the war. Most of them fought for the Union and a few for Confederates. Uh, 
um, because I mentioned they were abolitionists for the most part and say so they were fighting uh, you know, against the slavery. But in there, there were four Canadian brigadier generals that were in the, the Union Army and 29 congressional medals of honor were issued to Canadians. So that was pretty interesting statistics. If you look at this map, this was just uh, right after the firing in Fort Sumter. And once uh, Lincoln was elected in the election of 1860, these states here that are in dark red all succeeded uh, around the same time, uh, slightly different times depending on their state legislature. Uh, after Fort Sumter, after basically war was declared by, by Lincoln, uh, these states here in kind of lighter red, uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia seceded from the Union. And these states that were yellow, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland actually were slave states and they were gonna go with the South, but Lincoln made a capitul capitulation to them that he allowed them to have slaves and as long as they remain with the North. So those four states actually had slaves that were sanctioned by the, uh, the Union government at that time, but that kept them from going over uh, to, to the Confederacy. And the East of course out here, were all territories of Montana and, and Minnesota and so on weren't really existing yet. Canada, it, it had its own uh, geography. You know, at the time, Canada consisted of all these little fiefdoms. You had the um, Maritimes, you had PEI, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia that all were little uh, 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 like Commonwealth uh, countries, if you want to call it that. They had their own postal systems. They had their own government. And uh, then you had the province of Canada, which consisted of Canada East, which is the, the present day Quebec and Canada West, which is the present day Ontario. And all the rest of Canada <clears throat> was Hudson Bay territory. All this stuff in the middle and the end was uh, fur trapping and, and timber harvesting and, and that sort of thing. There was a, a government though in British Columbia and Vancouver Islands, they were again, separate little entities within the British Commonwealth. But it wasn't until Confederation occurred in 1867 that Canada became like more like one and the provinces uh, slowly joined, the, uh, uh, the, joined Canada. Okay, so that's kind of the introduction. And what I'd like to do now is just kind of get into uh, what I'm trying, I'm taking this from my exhibit that I've uh, shown a number of, of places. And uh, basically what I'm trying to show in, in a, I'm, some of these covers are very difficult to find, especially covers sent from the South to Canada to and from. But I'm trying to show that before the Civil War, the postal system, both in the North and the South worked fine. You know, the fact it worked better than it does today. I have covers that were, postmarked in Canada and four days later showed up in St. Louis. Right now, when I get mail from Canada, it can take as much as two weeks to get mail. So even in those days where they were delivering you with railroads and, and coach and so on, uh, mail faster than you get it now. Anyway, so pre-Civil War, things were pretty smooth. Uh, I'm gonna take a little ex a side trip here to talk about what, what, what caused the war? What were the driving forces that caused the Civil War? Um, and it's told by patriotic caches that, that make, help make the story. Very interesting period was a secession period when states were leaving the Union and attempting to join the Confederacy. But until February 4th, 1960, 1861, there was no Confederate government. So for a while, some of these states were known as the independent states. They had no country. They were by themselves in that period of time. And many U.S. Uh, Civil War collectors of postal history collect this period of time, these very short periods when the state seceded from the Union and before it joined the Confederacy. And sometimes it's only a matter of five or six days. So trying to find a postmark letter in that five or six day period is really tough. So those people that do that have a hard time completing all their, their, uh, their work. Um, so then I'll get into cross-border mail. Uh, both to and from Canada. And I'll be looking at showing you a lot of uh, US uh, covers going cross border. And we'll talk about you know, some military type covers and so on. 
But the interesting part of that whole thing is how uh, Canadians and, and Confederate people corresponded. Uh, you just couldn't put a mail in a mailbox that sent it to Birmingham, Alabama, and expect it to be delivered because, first of all, the U.S., the Union postal system wasn't taking mail from Canada. So there were all kinds of interesting ways that uh, that were devised to get mail and goods to and from Canada. And then I talk about the post-Civil War that was very slow return to go back to the whole federal system after the Civil War. Uh, in fact, it took maybe several years, four or five years before it was really working normal. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some examples of mail that was sent uh, pr prior to the Civil War. Okay, and I'm just gonna show a couple examples. This is what I collect. I have tons of, of covers that you know, cover the cross-border domestic provincial and so on. Uh, this happens to be a cover that was sent in the top one there from uh, Canada to Massachusetts. It's Frank with the black brown. Now the black brown 10 cent Prince consort is one of the rarest stamps in uh, you know, Canadian philately. And it was uh, one of the earliest cover colored uh, stamps that were published, uh, they were uh, uh, done in 1859. So you'll find that there are some variations of that color that uh, specialists uh, really like to go into the different varieties. And then the cover in the bottom is a registered cover. The, the rate uh, cross border was 10 cents uh, to Canada or from Canada, but the registration from Canada was another five cents. So this particular cover went to New York City with a 15 cent postage of which five cents was registered payment and, five, and 10 cents was a payment for the postage. Charles Furby, who was a dealer for many, many years and, uh, and his auctions cover a lot of Canadian stuff. Um, he recorded uh, all the covers that were available to him over his career from the decimal period and the Pence period. And so you'll see that there's a recording, like it says here that there was eight recorded covers with this ranking. So some of these things are pretty tough to, uh, to find. This uh, cover is probably the first patriotic cover issued in Canada. And I'm trying to gather information to prove that is true. Uh, this was a cover published when the Prince of Wales, who was uh, named Albert Edward, who eventually became King Edward VII of, of Britain. And uh, uh, this was a cachet was, was uh, published. And there's only about two of these, three of these covers that are known. And I have one of them, uh, I have one that has a five cent beaver that was used domestically. And this one happened to be a 10 cent concert cover sent to New Hampshire. So it was a cross border cover. But uh, I'm looking for an earlier cover, especially during the Pence period, haven't found one. But this is a, you know, quite a, a, rare, a rare find. And I got this last year at Eastern Auction, which is one of the big Canadian auction houses. It was buried in a box of small queen and uh, a bunch of uh, telegraph telegram cover and nobody spotted it so i was really happy to get this cover uh dynamite i think it's a very unique it's the only cover i've ever seen with the cross border and then at the beginning of the war canada started sending patriotic covers to the u.s and uh, these are all to uh, the northern states but uh, this was a ensign's uh, flag that uh, was usually is flown when a, when a British or a Canadian ship would visit a, a foreign port. So this is a special kind of a flag, but it was a very close to being the first patriotic, but it was issued then about six months later. Okay, now Canada to the Southern States mail was moving smoothly. You know, here you got covers going to Virginia. Uh, the 10 cent rate uh, shown here was the normal rate. And if you had a price is circular, uh, you know, a circular would advertise um, uh, vegetables or different kinds of goods. It was only a penny to send from Canada to the U.S. So that was quite quite a bargain. Georgia, it's another another cover going to the South pre Civil War. Uh, North Carolina, no problem at all. Uh, Northern states to Canada now. We're going the opposite direction. No problem sending uh, mail from Wisconsin. The, the rate was 10 cents, as I mentioned, and was usually paid with a Scott number 68, which is a 10 cent uh, green. 
and that was the Canadian rate. And it'd be all kind of exchange marks on here when I went through the, the exchange office at the border. Uh, Illinois, these are both one cent circulars going to Canada now. And uh, there, the rate is actually two cents. So when it got to Canada, uh, you can see here on the top one that it, you can see that little one half right there. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Well, one half uh, was the rate prior to the decimal period. So they were still using the old hand stamps in Canada, even uh, after the issue of the decimal period stamps. And here's one where the, uh, the, the postmaster actually put a one due of this uh, one cent rate going to uh, Canada East, which was present day Quebec. And then the Southern states of Canada was also flowing uh, quite readily. This, the top cover actually is kind of interesting. It was sent to Richmond CW. CW would be Canada West, That's, that was Ontario at the time. But the postmaster missed this as he thought this was going to Richmond, California. So actually this thing transited all the way across the United States, probably uh, through the Panama Canal. You know, the Isthmus of Panama was delivered uh, up to San Francisco by ship and went to, uh, uh, to Richmond, California, where it was rejected because it was going to, to Canada West. It was shipped all the way back to Canada again. And so there's a, uh, an acceptance uh, marking right here showing it was actually sent on April 2nd and was actually delivered back to Canada on May 27th. So that took a very long ride that cover to get back to California from uh, Virginia and then back to Canada, um, long trip. And many times people would mistake the rate going to Canada as three cents as the domestic rate was in the United States. Uh, so it turns out that that three cent did them no good because nobody would ca count it. And the recipient of the letter would have to pay the 10 cents. So it was uh, paid by the recipient. Here's one going from Texas to uh, Canada using a postal stationery with the, paying the 10 cent rate with uh, two threes and a, a penny. Okay, I wanna get into now, talk a little bit about the prelude to the Civil War and what that all means. And I'm doing it with these cached envelopes. Um, the top envelope, everybody uh, th thinks that the state's rights was really the thing that drove the Civil War, but it was really came down to slavery. The, the Southerners needed to have cheap labor in their cotton fields to pick the cotton and you know, bail it up and send it off to, to England to be put into uh, fabrics and textiles. So it definitely was a, a, a slavery issue. And this is a interesting cover. It's, it's, it's been, it's a very popular cover. It's been through a lot of big collections, but it shows a five cent rate. That's the rate within uh, Canada at the time. And it shows a, a, a Southern uh, man who's taking down the, the Union flag and gonna put up a Confederate flag. And his slave behind him says, uh, basically I've put that down flag massa. In other words, you better not do that because you're gonna be in trouble. And all these uh, patriotic covers have slogans that have little stories on them. They're kind of too small to read here, but it makes it kind of interesting. So this was one of the driving forces was slavery. <clears throat> now, within the slavery, there was a process called the Underground Railroad that I think most of you probably know what it was. It was a route, uh, it was actually run like a railroad. They had conductors that would uh, take people, uh, usually at night because the slaves would be running away from the, 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 their bosses in, in the Confederacy. And they would travel at night and stay in hidden places during the day. So they had these conductors and these were the railroads they would run. Here's a better shot of it. Um, in fact, uh, I live in uh, Westchester, PA and Kennett Square, which is about five miles from where I live was one of the main routes during the, this eastern route on the Underground Railroad. And if you ever get to Kennett Square and have some time in the summer, there's a, uh, a tour that they run visiting these Underground Railroad depots around K Kennett Square and shows you how they hid the slaves in tiny quarters and then put them in wagons at night with hay on top and then move up to, you know, uh, Allentown or something overnight. And um, 
it was kind of an interesting system. But there was uh, Eastern and Midwestern types of routes. Some of the, the, the slaves would go out you know, this way. They'd have to have money to pay a, you know, some kind of a, a ship captain to get them out of the, out of the, uh, the Confederate state. Um, just to go back here a second. This is an interesting cover. It looks like Dickens. It's, it's rough and it's bent and you know, torn and everything. And it was actually uh, sent from um, Ravina. You can't hardly read the postmark, but it's called Ravina, Canada West, sent to Galena, Illinois. Okay. And this John Nagel, who was the recipient, was a local justice of the peace. And I think he was a Confederate, uh, excuse me, a, a, a Union sympathizer or Union, uh, pro Union, because uh, I think that he uh, gave this, this slave his, uh, uh, maybe his house or his barn or something to stay in. And when the, and he gave this slave this envelope, it says, when you get to Canada, send me back this envelope and tell me that you got there safe. I'm making up this story, but I think it might be true. So I'm sure that the slave hid this envelope in his satchel or in his pocket or whatever. Got an underground railroad, got whatever way he got across the Canadian border. Now, once these guys, uh, these slaves made it to Canada, there was no sort of uh, uh, relationship that the the Canadian, the Canada had to return the slaves. <clears throat> now, there was a Fugitive Slave Act that was uh, uh, passed in the, the Union legislature that if a slave was actually caught in the North, he had to be returned to the South. So there were a lot of these slave catchers that would come into the Northern states going after these slaves. So it was a very dangerous business trying to be an escaped slave. But they got to Canada, they were really freed. So this cover may have been from a slave in Canada back to Galena, Illinois. And even today, Ravina is a very uh, fairly high percentage of uh, black in the population there. So it was one of the points in Canada the, the slaves ended up. <clears throat> this is a anti-slavery uh, cover sent from Wh to William Steele from Montreal. Um, the Canadians, of course, as I mentioned, were, were very... Uh, abolition minded. Uh, there was an anti-slavery office in Montreal and one in Philadelphia. This gentleman here shown is William Still. William Still was is credited being the father of the Underground Railroad. He was the one to kind of put this whole scheme together of uh, transporting slaves. In fact, he during his time he was living in Philly. He helped 8,800 slaves uh, escape to to the to the north or to the to the to Canada during his uh, his his time, and uh, uh, the U.S. Constitution Center in Philadelphia would love to have this uh, particular cover because it is very historical cover, but it's also from a Canadian viewpoint. There's only nine of these uh, covers with the the six penny perf. It's it's, a, it's in the Pence period that are are, uh, are are known. So it's also very valuable to me. <laughs> but I'm not gonna turn it over to them. John Brown, I mentioned him before. He was trying to get uh, slaves, a slave army put together. He had a lot of support from Canada. He went up to Canada, got some money, but the downside is at Harper's Ferry, he met his Waterloo. I love to have this cover. I bid against Dr. Jim Watt uh, at a auction in New York City, probably 15, 20 years ago but he had deeper pockets than me. So I'd love to have the John Brown cover, but uh, life goes on. As I mentioned earlier, the England's need for King Cotton. This, this is a, a, a nice depiction of that. It's a the 10 cent rate going uh, uh, within uh, Canada. That would be the double rate. Cause remember five cent beaver paid the single rate. Um, so they needed cotton, which is the reason why they needed slaves. Uh, one of the things Colonel Elmer Ells Ellsworth was one of Lincoln's uh, personal friends. And in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, he, he saw a, a ca Canadian sympathizer tearing down the Union flag and went up there and, you know, uh, confronted him. And the, the Confederate sympathizer shot 
Colonel Ellsworth. And uh, he was the first officer killed in the Civil War. So it became a big rallying cry, remember Ellsworth, remember Ellsworth, okay? Uh, these are uh, another depiction why uh, the South, these states seceded. In 1860, this was before the Civil War started, Lincoln was elected president. And everybody knew, especially the South, they knew that Lincoln was an abolitionist. Uh, in fact, as soon as he was, uh, it was announced and he won the election and before he was inaugurated, the state started seceding from the Union because they knew what was gonna happen. So seven, seven states, those states that were on the bottom of a US map uh, left the Union straight away. Lincoln received no electoral votes from any of those Southern uh, states. So this is the cover. It's kind of hard to see because it's embossed, but um, it's some uh, patriotic slogans on there. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, this period where states had left the Union, but there was no Confederacy to go to. And that's called the independent state period. Uh, the, the reason why these two here are highlighted in red is the fact that I have two covers that uh, are, are very, very rare that uh, basically were sent to Canada during the independent state period. So Georgia left in January uh, 19th, 1861 and joined the Confederacy on the day that it started in February 4th. South Carolina, which was the first state to leave the Union, uh, left on December 20th. So December 20th to February 4th, South Carolina had no <clears throat> allegiance to anything. There was no Confederacy. There was no you know, Union had, had left the Union and basically they were on their own. So this cover here was sent from Columbia, South Carolina and the date that it was sent falls in this period. So I got this a few years ago from Trish Kaufman who uh, has lots of these, not lots of these, but has lots of, of Confederate covers in her inventory. She's a dealer out of, uh, I think out of Washington. So this is a fairly, fairly rare independent state use to Canada. Then this one is one of these prices current going to New Brunswick. And it was sent from Savannah, Georgia, but after uh, Georgia was admitted to the Confederacy. So the US Postal Service was actually delivering mail for the Confederacy even after it was formed. But as I said, the end of April, they hauled out all mail uh, from the South. So basically it was really getting tough after that to send anything. Um, when the Southern states got occupied, you know, as soon as the war broke out, the Union went down and blockaded the ports like New Orleans and Charleston and so on. And they had a, a pretty good system set up where they had field wagons that would deliver the mail. So the mail systems actually worked pretty well for the Union Army during the war because so many places in the South were occupied that if somebody was stationed in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama or, or Tuscaloosa, Mississippi, wherever that is, that uh, they would get their mail delivered to them in uh, normal times. And as soon as the wagon would get there or, or, or whatever, they would get their mail. Um, so it was, it was uh, no problem with the soldiers from the North getting their mail. It was a big problem though, soldiers from the South getting their mail even sent from home. So these are, <clears throat> next thing I'm gonna show, and I'll show, you, show these fairly quickly, are covers that were sent cross border, first from the independent, uh, from the divided states. These divided states were the Kentucky, the Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware that uh, were slave states that uh, still were in the union and they still used the union postal system. So here you have a Kentucky. Uh, interesting again, Somebody in Canada put six one cent stamps on there thinking that was the rate to the US, but it wasn't, the rate was 10 cents. So those six cent stamps were worthless. They didn't, weren't counted. And the recipient had to pay 10 cents. Missouri was another uh, divided state who had slaves, but uh, were still part of the union. Kansas was a, uh, a territory, but just as the uh, war began, they were admitted to the union as a slave free state. I won't get into the details, but uh, part of that was because this John Brown went out to Kansas with a, a, a bunch of abolitionists, 
fought the slave owners and c converted Kansas from a slave state into a, a, a Union state. Now, West Virginia is interesting. West Virginia left Virginia in the middle of the Civil War on February, let's see, June 20th, 1863. The people in that part of Virginia were, were really anti-slavery. So they really felt more comfortable being with the North than they were being with the Confederacy. So that's, this was the state where you had brother fighting brother and cousin fighting cousins because you'd have people from the, the Virginia part of, of uh, the old Virginia part would be pro-slavery fighting for the Confederacy. And on the same, almost in the same block, there'd be relatives who were anti-slavery who would be fighting for the Union. And then Kentucky, uh, another one, and the Nebraska Territory, that was still a territory during the, uh, the Civil War. So it, it uh, this happened to be sent, you can't probably can't read this postmark here, but it was a, an Indian agency. And surprisingly, about 28,000, uh, over 28,000 Native Americans, Indians, fought for, uh, in the Civil War. And they both fought, the Southern Indians fought with the South as, as soldiers, and the Northern Indians fought with the Union. So it's very interesting, there were a lot of uh, Native Americans fighting in the Civil War. Uh, this now is, is um, military mail that was sent from Canada to the Union. So uh, surprisingly, a lot of the, the Union, the, the mail that I got from Canada were to doctors. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that um, uh, doctors were very educated. Uh, many doctors joined the Civil War effort and followed the troops around uh, servicing them with their wounds and so on. So this is to a Canadian doctor serving in the Union Army. It was sent to Washington. This was a one sent to Washington, but the, the uh, fellow had, uh, this major Livermore had left to go to New Hampshire. Um, this was a uh, sent to a soldier uh, who fought in the Chancellorsville battle, got wounded or something happened to him. And he went to this Turner's Lane Hospital that I researched in Philadelphia. And that was a uh, neurological hospital. In other words, if he had neuro nerve problems, that's where you go. So he probably got some injury during the war. He was mustered out though at, at the end of the war. So he survived the war, this gentleman. This was to a, an admiral in Washington, DC. It had a legis legislative uh, seal on it, which in Canada would allow postage free, but not going across the border. So they had to pay the 10 cents rate. I've got four letters that were sent from skedaddlers. Now, you probably have heard the word skedaddler, but a skedaddler was, I guess that term came up during the Civil War. It was somebody who was basically um, somebody who left the left his home to go to Canada to avoid being conscript, conscripted into the Union Army. Um, actually, 15,000 young men, mostly from the North, went to Canada. And uh, these all had letters in it, so it made very interesting reading and these young youngsters who you know, were missing their girlfriends, missing their parents and so on, but they weren't gonna come back because uh, when they came back, there was a good chance they'd be arrested, uh, be drafted or hung. In fact, 217 Northern deserters were executed during the Civil War. Uh, this is just two more of these uh, special covers. And this one uh, fellow here said, glad I did skedaddle from the war. I live happy and free. And I have my meals three times a day and a good bed to sleep. Money or not, I will stay in Canada. So they actually liked life up there. They even have some song sheets, some music written for these young guys who were in Canada. This is one called, Can I Come Home from Canada? And I got this at an antique shop in uh, California a few years ago. Um, okay, this is military mail now going to the Confederacy. Now at these times, the Confederates, these cities were actually occupied by Union soldiers. So you got, um, this is going to Tennessee, to a lieutenant there. This was going to Tennessee also, the Army of the Cumberland. This was going to Baton Rouge, uh, the, the second Vermont battery. So <clears throat> uh, these were going actually to Union. So they would pass through the Union post offices and without any problem. 
This was going to a blockade gunboat uh, in the USS Pombina that was in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, watching out for uh, blockade runners and so on. And uh, of course, they, the, this Mr. Bingham would only pick up his mail when he came back to port in New Orleans, it was then occupied then. So a lot of times the letters would accumulate there. And so they'd be received at the same time, even though they were written at different times in Canada. <clears throat> it's interesting to follow around some of these uh, soldiers. And this happened to be a doctor, but you follow the movement of the troops. So he was, this letter was originally sent to Fort Gaines, Alabama. Then he was moved up with the troops, uh, with the Indiana Volunteers to Kentucky. And then he finally ended up uh, in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, but all staying with his, his troops. This is another Dr. Sinclair, who uh, was, this was sent to him when he was in Clarksville, but unfortunately it was unclaimed because he had moved out of Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, this was sent to Clarksville address also, but uh, he had moved to Russellville, Kentucky which then was uh, constituted a three cent postage due when he received it there. And then he ended up at the end of the war in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Soldiers letters were special. Uh, if the officer in command ador endorsed this, the letter by writing across like, like this, that this letter would, would be sent through the mail without any stamps because a lot of these uh, soldiers wouldn't have stamps. But when it got to Canada, it would uh, be, have to be charged to the recipient again. So these are patriotic soldiers' letters here. Uh, these are different soldiers' letters that are endorsed. It's, come, it's hard to read some of them, but uh, they were sent uh, to Canada by, uh, by, the, by soldiers from Illinois, from Missouri. Uh, this was a, uh, sent from a camp near Culpeper, Virginia and from Camp Clara, Virginia. So these are all just military letters sent home. Uh, soldiers' letters, now this was sent from the South in Mississippi and Vicksburg. That was a very famous battle of Vicksburg in the Civil War. Uh, again, there's no, no stamps on here. It was paid uh, when it got to Canada. Same thing here, Canada, paid in Canada, and uh, paid in Canada. And you can see here this US 10 cents was what was due. This do three didn't mean anything because it was put on by the U.S. Post Office. Uh, and it's one of these, these uh, wagons who are in the battlefield. Okay, I'm going to go through the next uh, slides really quickly because they're showing now the, these uh, are patriotic covers sent from Canada to the U.S. And I said there's, I've gotten 52 of these things. I'm not going to show them all here, but we're going to go through them fast. And you can see what interesting themes some of these things have. Some are very, very colorful, banners, uh, shields, eagles, uh, sayings, eagles, globes, flags, flags, eagles, uh, sayings. These are not as colorful, but they're still qualified as uh, patriotic covers, cross flags, swords, eagles, and bayonets. You can't see that there because it's so small. Different kinds of flags. You notice that during the Civil War, the actual the number of, of stars in, the, in the, the, the Union flag varied. So here you have the stars arranged in circles. Uh, here they're arranged in a normal pattern. And here the stars are arranged in another star. So these were all different, uh, uh, different flags during the Civil War and all sent from Canada to the U.S. This was a regimental flag. So here it's the, the New York, I think it's the New York uh, State Militia here. So it's a special uh, flag. And here's another one sent to Utica with a, you know, an eagle carrying a flag. Uh, two young children here with an with a overseer. And then you see have two soldiers, the Union and the Confederate soldiers fighting in the background here. Um, this is uh, Lady Victory, I think it's called. She's, dre she's dressed in a flag and, you know, a flag beside her. Very rare cover. This is uh, a cover sort of dedicated to the memory of Jeff Davis. Skulls. And on top is a soldier who's also a skeleton. So this, there's only one of these that exists. I got this in the, the Bishop auction, which had three Canadian uh, covers in there. Battle scenes. 
simple covers with just some, you know, emboss embossment and some color. Uh, Fremont campaign covers were also, he was running for a presidential candidate with the Radical Democracy Party. Uh, they were qualified as, as patriotic covers. Consulate covers were qualified as patriotic covers. This is a, anything to do with Lincoln and Lincoln's death is really uh, hard to come by. This was a cover that uh, I dropped out of because it sold for $17,000 in the uh, Spink Shreve's auction in 2011. But it's a beautiful cover depicting Lincoln uh, Memorial after he had, he, he was killed a week after the Civil War ended. I also have covers that were sent <clears throat> from the provinces. This is sent from Nova Scotia with the Nova Scotia stamp. Remember, it was still its own little uh, you know, state in those days, a province. These are also from Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia. These were sent from New Brunswick, New Brunswick and New Brunswick. I don't have one from PEI. I'm not sure I, there are any available. I'd love to get one. Um, Okay, now that these are covers sent to Canada. So I'm gonna go through these again also fast, but they got the same sort of theme. You may have seen this one before, but a lot of times these were printed, the, the, the different printers copied CAD at one another. So this, this might be from a different printer, but it shows all, exactly the same colors and the same theme. So there's more flags, 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 flags. A uh, soldier with a drum, soldier with a saber, soldier standing at guard. Homemade patriotic cover showing Elmer Ellsworth, the one who, the first officer who died. A cover showing Abraham Lincoln. And this is kind of an interesting cover. It has two different co uh, five cent Jefferson stamps on it. It's got the olive yellow and the red brown on a patriotic cover to Canada. A lot of US people like that particular cover. And then uh, somebody asked something? Nope, I keep going. <laughs> um, this is, uh, uh, you know, the covers dedicated to one of the generals, General McClellan, who was one of the famous generals during the Civil War. Here's a standing Liberty, uh, Lady Liberty theme. And again, the globe, the, the eagle, the flag. Uh, just more and more of the, the same. These uh, type of covers to Canada from the US are more plentiful than ones from Canada to the US as you might imagine. Uh, it's more of the same. Cannons, ships, embossed, battle scene, somewhat simple. Uh, now these are to the provinces, so Nova Scotia, to Nova Scotia. Again, three cent stamp paid nothing, they had to be uh, returned or collected from the, uh, uh, this one was held for postage, so it wasn't uh, paid for by the Canadian who received it. Uh, this is to Nova Scotia, and I do have a cover to Prince Edward Island, overpaid by two cents. There's 12 cents worth of stamps. To New Brunswick, Okay, now I wanna show you some, some, this is some really rare stuff going to and from Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, during the, the occupied cities was no problem. The Union postal wagons would pour in there with mail, they'd take mail. So it may be delayed a few days, but nothing like it was in the South. So getting stuff in the South had it all kinds of devious ways. This is a letter that was written in Lake, uh, Lakeside, Canada West. It was hand carried by somebody to New York City where three cents uh, was hand stamped on there. It was then put in the US postal system and somehow uh, somewhere in Maryland was actually, it was sent to Charleston, South Carolina, you can see here. It was actually put into the Confederate system somehow. It could have been done by a courier. It could have slipped through accidentally, but it got delivered to uh, the recipient in Charleston. This is very, very rare blockade cover. Now, remember I mentioned that Lincoln declared a blockade. So all these ships that were delivering mail to 
Europe to Canada and so on, and not as just mail, but goods, you know, clothing and, and armaments or whatever they were looking for. Um, there was the U.S. Navy out there looking for these guys. So these blockade runners, uh, some of them had fairly fast ships, but they would uh, go through either uh, Nassau or Bermuda, Nassau, Bahamas, or Bermuda. Uh, and these were points within the British Empire that uh, uh, they, they could legally, you know, dock their boat. But this was a blockade cover sent from Canada, happened to be sent from the post office department, the dead letter office, not because they had anything to do with dead letters, because uh, the postmaster was writing to his brother. But you can see here that it was uh, sent to uh, Georgia. Uh, this 12 right here, 10 cents was the postage to the US. Two cents was a, uh, for the captain of the ship, okay? Uh, this was a, the forwarder by uh, Saunders and, and son who was resident in Nassau. And so there's a hand stamp in there and it uh, went to, to uh, uh, went to Georgia. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this was also a 12 cent payment, two cents to the captain, 10 cents for the postage. Uh, not a lot of markings on it, but I was able to figure out that the Colonel Lamb was a high speed Confederate blockade runner boat that was uh, probably the fastest at the time. And it, it got a lot of things through. It was came towards the end of the war though. So, uh, uh, but it was able to outrun Union ships. Uh, here's, oops, here's mail going, wait a second. Okay. This is mail going uh, from occupied southern cities to Canada. Okay, so we're going from the Canada from the south to Canada now. So we're going to go the opposite direction. This is blockade mail now. That's going from uh, let's see, we went from uh, Cordsville, South Carolina, via NASA. You can see the NASA right here, the hand stamp that shows it went through NASA was took, taken by a, a blockade running ship. To, Niagara, to Canada, uh, to Halifax usually, and then it would be have shipped uh, to Canada's Niagara Falls on the Canadian side of the, of the river. Um, this was also from the same correspondence. Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the, po the postman, postman in uh, Matt Nassau didn't have any ink, so it, it was an albino. But you can see when you hold it up to the light, look at it, it was actually a strike, but there's no ink on the uh, hammer. But this is fairly rare blockade mail going the other way. Very interesting one here because in the summer of 1864, there was a yellow fever epidemic that was sweeping Bermuda. So the, the blockade runners stopped going through Bermuda on their deliveries and they used Halifax as the point of uh, demarcation or the point of visiting. So this is a Halifax uh, 10 cents, uh, stamp hand stamp here uh, on the back there's a uh, Halifax Nova Scotia receiver this cover was actually sent to Virginia so it went all the way to Halifax it went uh, from it was shipped from Camp Price North Carolina to Halifax and then it was uh, sent across border to Virginia uh, to Rich Richmond to Portsmouth Virginia so it was a long uh, route to get that letter to, uh, to Virginia, but it was all because of this yellow fever problem they had yeah, for several weeks uh, in uh, Bermuda. There's just another one going through the Bahamas. Again, it had a three cent stamp. So the postmaster wrote on there, postage not paid. So I'm, I'm sure when it got to Canada, uh, it was paid, but it was, has the right markings on it. This was on the back stamp, so it was a, a blockade cover. This is even a, a rare situation. It's called a flag of truce cover, okay? Now, this was a, a kind of a special way. It, it went through two postal systems. It would first be sent from the south to a exchange office, uh, usually in Port Comfort, Virginia. And so you have two envelopes. The inside envelope, the outside envelope was the envelope that was from the southern city to the 
Port Comfort, okay? So when it got there, it would be opened up, the envelope would be discarded, but inside was another envelope that was the envelope that was finally going to the Northern city, in this case, to Canada, okay? Also, you can see here that you had to pay the postage going from Port Comfort to Canada uh, or, or to the US. There's a, there was some coin. It was kind of locked up in there by a stamp. You can see the outline of a stamp. And there was a coin there and they would open up that uh, envelope, take that coin out and that paid for the postage to, it was supposed to go to Canada, but it wasn't enough. So it, it got a 10 cent due when it got to Canada anyway. But that's called a flag of truce mail. So it was a special type of mail. So you see how it was very, very difficult to get letters sent from the South to Canada, to and from Canada during the Civil War. They had to go through all sorts of contortions to have this happen. Here's another way, if it, if it was a, uh, a prisoner of war cover, the prisoner of war letter, it had to go uh, you know, through another set of uh, you know, military mail. This was a cover that was on eBay about 10 years ago and I spotted it, but so did uh, a stamp dealer. Uh, maybe you know Labron uh, Harris, I think his name is. He, uh, he spotted this and I did, and I thought I, I put in a hefty bid, but his bid was heftier. <laughs> so he got the, this, <clears throat> there's only four covers, Galen uh, Harrison, who's an expert on prisoner of war covers, there's only four covers to Canada, and this is one of the four. And it's I got a cert for it from the Civil War or from the Confederate Stamp Alliance, so it's it is bona fide legitimate. So it is a prisoner of war cover, uh, one of the few going to Canada. Other ways that things were sent through the mail to tell people about the Civil War were newspapers, and it was very interesting. I have a whole newspaper here; you can open up and read some of the the actual battle uh, war information that's going on in August, 1862 in, in the United States. It was shipped within Canada. So a, a one cent Canadian postage put on there. That was a Toronto Globe. This was a Pontiac, Michigan uh, pioneer. And it also had interesting civil war uh, information in it. Uh, the Racha Patriotic covers within the US that show the relationship between the, the union and uh, Canada didn't have the maple leaf flag at the time. The Canadian flag was looks like this, looks more like a British flag. They didn't get the Canadian flag until just recently, you know, only a few decades ago. That same cover I mentioned to you that's the rarest cover in Canada, I actually got one used in the U.S. So you can see here it was, it was uh, franked within the U.S., sent to New Hampshire, I think, with a three-cent Washington. So that was kind of a special find. I was happy to get that. After the war... It took a long time for postal uh, systems to readapt, the, the Confederate postal systems to readapt. And uh, it's some interesting statistics I'll show you in a minute, but these, these show that uh, the war ended in April. So it was, you know, maybe almost in the fall before you started seeing a flow of mail from uh, uh, to and from Southern states. This is two Southern states. This is going to Georgia, Alabama, Alabama, this was in 60, 1867, 66, May to Virginia, Virginia, um, Virginia and West Virginia. They didn't really know if this guy was in West Virginia or Virginia because it split, the state split during the war, but even after it was kind of a problematic. Uh, Louisiana and then Texas. Then going to Canada, uh, you know, again, it started up late. The war ended in 1865, here's 66, six, this is 68, going from South Carolina, three different, different ones. And then I just wanted to show you uh, something here at the end that uh, by November of 1865, that was uh, a little more than six months after the Civil War ended, only 241 of the 8,900 post offices in the Confederacy were back under federal control. In other words, they were still operating as part of the US, the Union federal system. By 1866, a year later, only 36% had rejoined the US Postal Service. So it was very, very slow in getting going in after the war. Um, 
what happened, and I'm going to show the rest of this now because it, it's more pertinent to Canada. Can I get a scarf in the car? Yep. Yeah, I'm done now. <laughs> but um, w one thing that um, was happened after the war was that a lot of the soldiers from, uh, from the north were allowed to keep their guns and their ammunition. And the Irish uh, soldiers decided they wanted to invade Canada and, you know, sort of the manifest destiny idea. They actually had some skirmishes along the border and people were killed, but it never really uh, got that far that, you know, that, that they declared war because the British had sent in a lot of troops in, uh, in Canada. So it never happened, but there could have been, uh, what did happen was Canada became a country because they were being, you know, forced to by the Americans and their invasions and stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. And I'll take questions if you have any. And uh, thank you for sitting through my long presentation. I hope it wasn't too uh, overbearing. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause to Ron because that was probably one of the best uh, presentations we have ever had. And I really want to thank you, Ron, for just a simply amazing uh, journey through the Civil War here and the communication between the, the Canada and blockade mail and run and across the border. I mean, just simply, uh, uh, as you know, stellar and award-winning and something we all hope to aspire to, Ron. I really appreciate that. Any any questions for Ron, please? Uh, let's open it up. Yeah. Ron, a question I have, maybe I'm, this is so much neat stuff there. You're talking about there, in this period, there are several stampless covers coming from Canada. Was this due to the grace period that we had in the United States that you could send stampless for five or six years after the stamps came out? Uh, well, uh, you know, it was optional, you know, during that time, even within Canada, if, if you sent a, uh, a letter to your, your relative across Canada, that you would pay seven cents, it'd be five, if you didn't put a stamp on it, you, you could put it in the mail and they'd deliver it. Mm -hmm. But the recipient had to pay the five cents postage plus the seven cent, uh, the two cents uh, penalty. Excellent. So even in the 1860s, uh, it happened that um, you could use a stampless cover, and that's what uh, they did during the war. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. For those interested in Ron, I'm, I'm interested in, in obviously the uh, the blockade mail. I mean, Steve Walski now is doing a multi part series in the Chronicle for the Classic Society. I'm reviewing and proofing his latest one on on another Civil War blockade, uh, the Leaky Will of the Wisp. There are many, many ships that ran the blockade, your covers that uh, ran the blockade. I mean, they're just few and far between, and you know, using Bermuda and or parts of the Bahamas to, to sort of skirmish around there, or at least get around is uh, quite a bit there. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm just still taken aback by the fact that they would use the dime, the dimps, and the, 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 the single cover that would have had that underneath the stamp uh, to, get, to, to get through there, to pay the outer envelope and the inner. Um, do we yeah. know what stamp was on the cover that was sealing that? Do yeah, you know the, the uh, that that cover I think may have been may have come from Walski's collection. Yeah, I yeah. know one of my covers did for sure. One of the blockade covers. Yeah, because uh, I know it's the only one that was sold in the Siegel's auction. I think mm -hmm. it was a uh, I think a number sixty five. Is that a three cent? Yeah, that USA. is a three cent. So I was yeah. So that was a three cent, probably right. And they just they yeah, sealed they the dime underneath. You can look mm -hmm. look at the color and see the kind of pinkish yep, of that stamp. Yep, yep. That makes but, sense. You know, the, the coin was buried underneath it, so they tore the stamp off, and, you know, to get the coin. Sure. But it wasn't enough to, to go to Canada. They had to, you know, pay for well, it. Well, I saw the ten the, the ten hand stamp had to make up exactly, the difference. Yeah. So they paid that due when it got there, correct? Yeah, but you can see how difficult it was because it, you know, sending a letter from the, the south to that flag of truce, you'd have somebody read it. Of course, they. They didn't want to have any kind of war secrets that were uh, being sent across exactly. the border. Exactly. It, was, uh, it was amazing. Yes, yeah, so if any, anybody is an interested, in, go ahead, Ron. Go ahead, please. Yeah, it's an interesting area. Uh, I, I still am working, trying to get more uh, southern to Canada covers. They're, they're really hard to find. And every dealer I, I ask, you know, have you seen one from uh, Louisiana or from, you know, Texas is a real tough. Uh, I have one cover that was sent to Texas, but nothing from Texas. 
Well, so I know LeBron pretty well. Um, and clearly you were able to, even after he acquired the prisoner of war, were able to add it to your collection and exhibit. So well, he made was, a lot of money. <laughs> he did. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I bid him up on, on eBay. Right. Right. And of course he was going to, he bid me up when he went to sell to me. I, sure. Of course. No, we know LeBron well. So yeah, no, thanks yeah. for sharing that too. That's, it's a great piece as well. So any well, other yeah, questions, it's, it's, you know, it's only four of them exist. So I can't write yes. yes. about that. I have this book uh, by Trish Couchman, a monograph by La Posta, and it is oh, the about the mail during the independent states, Ron, what you're talking about, be after they seceded, but before the Confederate states started. And she kind of went through state by state with some like, just very interesting, interesting manuscript. Yeah, but unfortunately, I, you know, I have no expertise in all, but I saw this that. That just yeah. looks interesting, and it was, it really was. But I, and if uh, anybody would like to borrow it, I have it. Well, you know, the collectors that collect that stuff routinely, you know, and that's that stuff you you have to pay through the nose for because there's so few of those independent state covers that are around. You know, you, you'll very seldom see them come up in auctions. You know, and and Trish knows every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> she she does, doesn't she, Ron? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we'll come Trish through. We've all been uh, on her desk at one point or another. That's for sure. Trisha's coming to speak with us later in the year on uh, the Madison, Florida provisionals. So yeah, she's great. Part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had, in fact, last fall, they had up in the state college yep. a whole uh, session just on uh, Civil War uh, postal history. And unfortunately, I was in Brazil at the time. So Bill Schultz, my buddy here from Westchester, he carried up my uh, my exhibit and installed it for me, and I I got a gold, which was was nice. But uh, the judges have all said the same thing, so that's why I took out the last part of my talk. This business about the civil civil war and how it affected Canada, they said that doesn't really belong. You're talking about postal communications across the border. Now the end of it, you're thrown in postal communications up in Canada across with the provinces. So I. That stuff was really rare stuff too, but I, but I had to take it out. And I think maybe the next time I show it, if I beef up with a few more Southern covers, I think I'll maybe get close to a large gold, but I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Thank but you, Ron. Any, any other questions, please? Larry, did I see your I have a please? question. Yes. Sure. Um, Ron, the cover that went from North Carolina to Virginia via Halifax, if yes. both those states were part of the Confederacy, why the roundabout route? Um, well, they could have used the other routes. They could have used the flag of truce. But sometimes that took longer than actually sending it by boat uh, from the south to Halifax, or in most cases they went to, to uh, Bermuda. Uh, what's the city in Bermuda? I have written it. Hamilton. Hamilton, Bermuda. Hamilton. Or, Nassau, Bahamas, and then would, would end up going to Canada uh, because it would be all British, you know, it would be a British uh, delivery service. And there were a lot of problems with the, you know, the ships from the Confederacy or from Britain because uh, I don't know if you've ever heard about the Trent affair. It happened during the Civil War where they, they caught a, a blockade running ship that had two Confederate diplomats on it going to negotiate arms agreements with the Brits and they confiscated the ship and, you know, it was a, a mess. Mm. But uh, yeah, it was a sort of a circuitous route going from, I forget the port, maybe to at uh, the time, maybe it's Wilmington, North Carolina, to Halifax, and then finding its way back to, to Virginia. But it, it, it did. <laughs> Thank you. And that's because Portsmouth was occupied, right? Yeah. Yeah, had it not been occupied, they could just use their internal mail. I mean, you know. Yeah, they could have, right. They could have used the internal mail. But, uh, okay. Yeah, the fact that all these cities in the South were occupied really uh, messed things up for the, uh, well, being occupied messed things up for the Confederacy anyway, because the Union took control of the Mississippi River, and that was shut off one of the main conduits for, for the, you know, the South. A quick question, maybe not related, but I, I think of interest. And uh, I've heard parts of it. And I think that the guy's name is McConnell, and he was in charge of printing stamps, and he had his own picture put on oh, yeah. it. Maybe you just, you know, a thumbnail of that. Just a great story. 
yeah. Canadian his, postal history. Yeah, those, those stamps command a lot of premium in the auctions too. They're, they come up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But they, yeah, he illegally printed his own stamps. <laughs> they like Trump. <laughs> so <laughs> they might be out there already. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, please, for Ron? Uh, what you've seen there again, I mean, award winning and acclaimed and just some amazingly unique pieces. And again, we thank him. And uh, he was gracious enough again to let us record this. So we'll edit it. And he also shared the, the deck as well. So you'll get to really look at some of those uh, unique pieces very close up as well when you see the PDF. I mean, again, it's just a just a phenomenal piece of history here that you, Ron, you've carved out an amazing nugget and a really amazing nugget of, of, of unique pieces of postal history uh, during this time period. It's really amazing. I'm What's still that line? Postal part? history is history. Yeah, postal history is history. To quote our good friend, Timmy O'Connor, whether he's dressed as Ben Franklin or not, we, we like to quote Timmy because Dr. O'Connor has said it many times, postal history is history. Correct. Well, if you guys can look out for Canadian uh, uh, Civil War covers, I'm a buyer. <laughs> so. all, right, all right, everybody. Look, follow George Haber's advice and look in the bottom of your drawer. And if you guys have a few of those covers, you know, Ron is, you got to give Ron a call. Absolutely. Well, you never know. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Okay, Thank well, you, Ron, again. again. The Thank invite. You. It was uh, my pleasure to, to talk to you guys. And okay. I love Thank your you. newsletter. I, I read it every time, page cover to cover. Thank you. And uh, you guys do a great job out there. Thank you, Ron. We really appreciate it. And hopefully maybe, you know, if you ever have a part two or three and you want to come back for the second half, you know, you're always welcome. So anytime, anytime, Ron. Well, I can tell you a lot about Canadian rates. You know? yes. <laughs> but uh, what, what I found interesting tonight was that the rate was pretty uniform all on all sides in all directions. Yeah. And the 10 cent rate. And that, that seems to simplify it a bit. You know, you have registration and you have, you know, short paid, quite well, on short paid. When they paid three cents instead of 10, did that three cents count at all? Or did no. It, oh, really? Either way, it, U.S. didn't count. And if they put, wow. a, you know, uh, didn't put enough postage on going to the U.S. None of it counts. Just wipe it out. It's like nothing. Wow. Okay. No credit. Interesting. Yeah. So. Well, good. Well, thank you again. All right. We appreciate Ladies it. and gentlemen, it's very good to talk to you all and, and hope to see you again sometime face-to-face -face somewhere or someplace. <laughs> we, we will. <laughs>